Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my first uh, duty and indeed pleasure is to uh, introduce the members of the panel. Uh, on my left is John Borshoff, who is Managing Director and CEO of Paladin Energy Limited. And then on my right, uh, first is uh, Dr. Selena Ng, who is uh, Regional Director, Southeast Asia and Oceania for Areva, and Michael Anglin, who is uh, CEO of the Australian Uranium Association. Before handing over to um, the panel to start the discussion, um, I'll make some, uh, some brief uh, introductory remarks. Uh, the key factors that are making Asia a major growth area for nuclear energy include the rapidly increasing growth in electricity demand, reflecting the demand for rising living standards, and concerns about energy security, clean air, and climate change. Despite the Fukushima accidents, these drivers all continue to apply today, though the consequences of Fukushima for countries with earthquake and tsunami risk areas may take some time to work through. Detailed analysis of the Fukushima accidents will take months, if, if not years, but already uh, there are calls to strengthen international oversight of nuclear safety and for greater international cooperation in energy management, uh, in emergency management, I should say. One question that comes to mind is whether there's scope for greater regional consultation on um, nuclear programs. Some people are questioning whether the potential complexities of nuclear power are beyond the capabilities of a single country, let alone a single power utility to manage. And this is particularly an issue for new entrants, for countries that are newly starting or thinking of starting nuclear power programs. A major issue for nuclear energy, and I think uh, uh, the Fukushima situation brings this out, uh, is maintaining public confidence. And this is not simply a matter of the facts, but the way the facts are presented and the way the facts are understood by the public. We've seen considerable une unevenness in me media reporting on Fukushima. Uh, and I'd make the observation that on most subjects, journalists are very careful about the credentials of those they interview. But on nuclear issues, it seems that anyone with an opinion can pass for an expert. So, on that note, <laughs> I look forward to the panel's discussion, particularly to hear the industry's perspectives on issues such as safer technology, future nuclear governance, public information, and how industry and governments might work together on these matters in the future. Um, so let me first um, uh, invite Michael Anglin to uh, start Thank the you. discussion. Um, when, when this was uh, originally uh, set up, this function today, it was, had a somewhat uh, uh, broader uh, subject matter, but I think understandably um, uh, the accident at Fukushima uh, has focused us all on that and uh, of course we, uh, we couldn't proceed without, uh, without talking about Fukushima and so I'm going to talk about Fukushima. Um, I want to talk about uh, uh, what's changed what hasn't changed and what are the appropriate responses or what are at least some of the range of responses which might be taken to the uh, accident at Fukushima. Uh, John's already touched on this but what hasn't changed uh, are the drivers of the demand for nuclear power. The uh, world's population is going to grow from uh, 7 billion people to 9 billion people by the middle of this century and demand for energy is going to triple. Uh, and uh, the greatest increases in demand for energy are going to come from countries which are currently uh, not as wealthy as we are and want to be as wealthy as we are. Um, they, look at the, they look at the wealth in our countries and they want that too and who would want to deny that aspiration to them. Um, so new, demand for nuclear power pre and post Fukushima is being driven by um, uh, aspirations for wealth in some of the poorer parts of the world, in, and especially in Asia. Secondly, it's being driven by the quest for energy security. Uh, countries want to uh, diversify their energy sources and the supplies of their energy. 
um, so that uh, they are not dependent on uh, one or few sources of energy or one or few countries to supply them. So that's some of the other drivers of nuclear power. And the third, the third is climate change. Um, and uh, no, one, no one needs to tell this audience that uh, uh, across the nuclear fuel cycle emissions, uh, emissions are very low, uh, comparable, comparable, to, comparable to wind uh, for the same output and less than solar. Um, and uh, so th those, those, drive, those drivers hasn't, haven't changed. Um, the other thing which hasn't changed uh, in the nuclear fuel cycle is, its, is the risk associated with it. Um, we all know what those risks are, but the nuclear fuel cycle remains uh, as, as safe before Fukushima, uh, safe after Fukushima as it was before. Now, I've no doubt that the accident there will, uh, will prompt some reconsideration of safety and uh, particularly, uh, uh, particularly the location of plants, I think is clearly an issue which is going to be, uh, uh, which is going to be considered the following Fukushima, but there's no doubt that the, uh, uh, that the safety of the nuclear fuel cycle is the same after Fukushima as it, as it was before. So I don't think those things have changed. I think some things have changed. Um, one and one of the things which has changed, and this is not this is not attributable to to, to, Fukush, to Fukushima, um, but the economic context in which um, we talk about nuclear power today, in, we, in the economic context in which we talk about the accident of Fukushima today, is a very very different economic context um, to the one in which we talked about Three Mile Island or Chernobyl. Uh, so I think that economic context has changed and I think uh, uh, one of the reflections of that is the way in which uh, the accident of Fukushima has been reported in the media. And I, I found the media reporting extremely interesting because on the one hand, um, uh, those frontline reporters, those who are sifting and moderating the information that we in Australia in particular have received from Japan under, under in, in quite chaotic conditions, under enormous pressure, trying to produce a story every day, uh, I think uh, uh, have, have focused, and this is, uh, I don't mean this as any criticism, have focused on the, the sensational and the immediate. And that always hasn't uh, as, uh, as, as well informed uh, the broader community as it might have. But I don't say that as a criticism. I just make that as an observation about the pressures which French frontline journalists operate under. Compare, compare that, however, to the editorials and the opinion pieces. They have been calm, moderate, and broadly in Australia at least supportive of, of nuclear power, even, even in those parts of the media where you might least expect that. So I think that uh, <clears throat> I, can't, I can't confess to have, having been uh, um, very close to the nuclear industry in the, in the 1980s, but I suspect that uh, that reporting has been quite different. Um, also, I think we can't ignore here uh, the social media. Uh, on the Twitter sphere and the blogosphere, there has been a raging debate. Uh, and I suspect that those who participate in that debate and those who read it um, uh, have become much more informed um, about, the, about the nuclear industry than they will have been beforehand. Uh, admittedly, if you look at those debates in the Twitter sphere and the blogosphere, um, they are uh, enormously, uh, enormously complex and you have to do a lot of sifting, but my guess is that people have become much more educated as a result of, uh, as a result of those social media, uh, and I think that's a very big difference, and I think for, for the nuclear industry, a quite positive difference from, uh, from a generation to go, ago. <clears throat> One of, the, one of the things which I think will have changed post Fukushima uh, is uh, our public perceptions of the nuclear fuel nuclear industry, and I've got no doubt that in the short term uh, public perceptions will be less confident of the nuclear industry than they were. But my guess and my expectation uh, is that uh, uh, that uh, perceptions of the nuclear fuel industry uh, will return uh, to what they were prior to Fukushima. <coughs> Um, <clears throat> that will, however, depend at least to some extent on how governments react uh, in their own domestic uh, political circumstances to Fukushima. Um, uh, what can governments do in these circumstances? I think, um, I think what the best thing that they can do is to demonstrate by their political leadership the, the economic and political reasons why they support nuclear power. I think the most... Uh, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the governmental response which has most impressed itself upon me has been President Obama's response uh, to Fukushima, which has been to uh, reassert and re-endorse the United States' commitment to nuclear power in an unashamed and unembarrassed way. And uh, I think that for the United States, what that will mean uh, is that uh, 
um, uh, uh, the continuation of the development of the nuclear industry uh, in the United States will be a much easier proposition than for those governments which have suddenly become coy about nuclear power or have become uncertain, because that coyness and that uncertainty is going to project itself into, uh, amongst, the, uh, amongst those who listen to those messages, and when inevitably most of those countries return to the growth plans they have for their nuclear industries, those governments will have to confront their own coyness and their own uncertainty, and they'll have to explain have to explain to their populations, to their citizens, why it is they're no longer they're no longer coy and uncertain. So I think the uh, I think the uh, uh, the governmental response have to, has to be very carefully calibrated. Uh, and uh, um, yes, I think it is it is right to to uh, uh, to focus on the uh, the safety of uh, nuclear power plants in one's country. But how how one does that as a leader of government, I think, has to have an eye to where actually you want to be in the future. And as I say, I think President Obama's response has been uh, has been one which will serve his country far better than the the coy and negative responses which have occurred in other countries, which will inevitably have to come back to nuclear power. Uh, I think the, um, uh, uh, it, it's, it's in many ways it's too soon to predict uh, how, how the industry will respond to Fukushima, um, but I think at the broad level what you can expect from the, uh, uh, from the nuclear industry, including the Australian uranium industry, is a stewardship response, by which I mean uh, the various sectors in the nuclear industry working together uh, to examine, to identify, uh, identify issues and to respond to those <coughs> Uh, to those things which happen in its own in its own backyard, uh, we in the Australian uranium industry are thinking about that right now. I, I can't tell you we have an answer about that because you do need to reflect on these things in order to in order to understand uh, what the content of that stewardship response should be. But that's I think what what the response will be. Uh, as for cooperation between government and industry, which is the question that uh, I know the Lowy Institute was keen for us to address, I think uh, at, at all levels, at the global level um, uh, and domestically, uh, there, there is a need and, and uh, all of us will see cooperation between governments and the industry in response to the, to the issues which are being raised by Fukushima. I have to say that, that the issue of public education has been raised. Um, and, uh, and the question is being asked, what's the scope for government industry cooperation in public education? I have some doubts about that, I have to say. Not because I'm against cooperation with governments, and certainly not, I'm not against public education. Um, but the, what we know about the way perceptions of risks are formed in the nuclear industry, one of the things we know is that people, uh, people take, a, 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 one of the reasons people take a negative view of the nuclear industry because they see it as remote from them and they see it as the creature of big government and big nuclear. And the worry I would have that that kind of high level cooperation in public, in public education would send the very opposite signal um, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, a quest for better public education through the mechanism, through the joint government industry mechanism might give. So um, I think I have to be convinced of, uh, of government, and, government and industry globally or domestically running a public education campaign. But I think that does, does bring it back both to the importance of the political response governments make and the calibration of that response in the face of the, uh, in the, face of the electoral and political consequences that they perceive. And I also think that the, 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 the nuclear industry and the uranium industry here in Australia, we probably also need to look, at, uh, at a, look again to our own efforts in that regard to see what more we can do. And, and now, thank you, Martin, I'll stop. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Uh, next, next, I'll invite uh, John Bullshoff to um, uh, present his views. I'll be regulated in my time by uh, <laughs> the sheets I'll be reading from. But I just wanted to say the context in which I will try and present is uh, in the framework of risk. And people should remember that in the 70s and late 60s, uh, the nuclear electrification was forged in a backdrop of risk. It was, uh, it was at a time when the Cold War was there and the fear that that created the, uh, the antagonism. So when apparently no other technologies had risk, nuclear had risk. When coal had no risk, when oil had no risk, when climate change was no risk, when the atmosphere, you could do anything you like with it. And, and uranium was, nuclear was defended as the only 
risk, industry, and everything else was against that comparative. Of course, today it's a completely different thing. It's a comparative risk, and, and, and nuclear is very well geared to, uh, to defend the risk issues of, at all levels of its uh, cycle. So, for me, it's already apparent that just after five weeks since the devastating earthquake and tsunami struck Japan, that the reactors at Fukushima nuclear plant are slowly being stabilised. Fortunately, or unfortunately for the anti-nukes, no deaths have occurred. The reactor containments have remained essentially intact. And although there has been some releases of radioactivity, I believe it's doubtful this will cause harm even in the mid to long term. The intense media interest with Fukushima is waning and is now just, apart from some sporadic outbursts, the media jackals have moved on. Fukushima is relegated to the normal news, or as much as is possible for nuclear to be, hidden in the midsections of newspapers, and no amount of hyperbole could make that thing blow up. And science held true, in my opinion. We've watched the recovery efforts has been played out at Fukushima power plant, where there's been some extraordinary efforts to stabilise these units. And they're ongoing, and it seems they're getting, thankfully, progress albeit slowly. The media frenzy and stakeholder position that has emerged is feed, uh, has emerged feeding on that hyperbole and imagination with very little leadership or cool heads, apparent even in the global scale, has not helped the situation. The Japanese, on the one hand, are being embraced by the world in dealing with the earthquake calamity, and on the other hand, are being isolated with the ignorance and fear that is being exhibited by many. I must preface my, my statements that I'm not an expert on nuclear, on reactor technology. So my comments are at a high level. But that, those, those reactors have withstood forces way beyond their design specification and inability to resist the inundation of water which knocked out the cooling equipment was essentially the main problem. Unlike Three Mile Island or Chernobyl, this is not an operator error, but a consequence of profound and un unpredicted force of nature. The operators are grappling with the situation, although there's been some release of radioactive material, the negative effects are most probably confined to the inner zones of the evacuated area at this stage. It is not a Chernobyl, and although many in the opposing camp claiming it is, even Chernobyl, which was a catastrophic failure of a reactor core, is now seen to be an event that even after 25 years has not caused that doomsday consequence alleged by the nuclear opponents. When all this settles down, the big issue that will confront Japan and all other economies is how to continue producing enough electricity, which is the foundation of economic well-being. Energy strategists of Japan have many years ago made the decision that nuclear is essential and I believe will remain so when considered in terms of environmental, technological, safety, strategic and economic grounds. The renewables are out of the question for baseload power, and gas is already overloaded as a key offset to coal and growth. It is my belief that Japan, as for all the nuclear industry, will learn from this and improve and move on. There are lessons to be learnt, and this will further augment what is one of the safest industries in the world. This leads to the question of nuclear outlook, the industry itself. I also firmly believe that the outlook remains positive. There are 440 odd reactors out there and they'll continue to deliver electricity at optimal levels. And there are 60 odd reactors under construction to be built 
and those on schedule for construction starts, particularly those in the emerging nuclear economies along with Korea and Russia will proceed. In terms of environmental performance and technology of capability, as I said, this and on strategic grounds, nuclear is a must in the energy fuel mix required to getting, and there's no way, no way getting away from that fact. It has got to this vital position not because nuclear is loved, far from it. It has got there because of its enormous capability to deliver massive amounts of electricity in a carbon-free and comparatively safe manner. There's no credible replacement for this. Uranium demand will not appreciably change, and that means the issue of uranium supply, which is my area of expertise, to fuel the current and new nuclear fleet becomes even more interesting. Those of you that have heard me before know my position that uranium supply, I believe, is in fundamental shortage. Paradoxically, I believe uranium prices will go up. That the US may delay building its programs, and there are, is there is evidence that US utilities, some want to proceed and build new units. That the Germans may close a few plants early does not change this dynamic. China, Korea, Middle East, and Russia have reaffirmed the commitment to nuclear. And in a strange way, the current events will exacerbate the shortage. In the 80s and 70s, nuclear development was spearheaded by five countries, US, USSR, France, Britain, and Japan. And in the end, built 250 reactors between them and were basically the reason the nuclear boom started. Not all 30 countries that would eventually have nuclear started together on day one. This time, it is China, India, Middle East, Korea, and Russia that have the lead the charge and will, will build about 250 reactors by 2030, in addition to the 62 they will reoperate. You can bet with this lot committed, other countries will follow as they did in the, in the 70s and 80s. There may be a slight delay in these, as these countries revisit and upgrade plans as a result of lessons learned from Fukushima. Nuclear power today provides 14% of electricity safely and very clearly and with benefits to the immediate and future environment. The Fukushima emergency de demonstrates the resilience of nuclear technology. In this case, technology devised over 40 years ago and has generated massive amounts of electricity which propelled economic growth of Japan and via trade the world. There is no denying that Fukushima emergency is a setback in public opinion toward nuclear but it does not in any way undermine the case for nuclear power. Stronger political leadership, less emotion, more informed comment will stabilize the public debate. The key issue will remain, how else do we produce these huge amounts of electricity needed within, with least risk and within a comparative risk analysis? Thank you. Hmm. Thank you, John. Uh, finally, uh, uh, I'll invite uh, Selena um, mm. to, uh, uh, to give us some remarks. Okay. Well, as Michael mentioned uh, before, when Martin first invited us, us, invited us earlier this year to come and talk to this panel, it was more about non-proliferation, I think, uh, which is a topic that we all agreed to come upon. And then, of course, that was before Fukushima happened. So uh, we're here today to talk about, about the role of industry um, uh, post-Fukushima. And um, in that respect, I guess I should just preface my remarks by saying I come at this from a slightly different perspective from Michael or, or from John. Uh, for those of you who don't know Riva, where we are involved in uranium mining, but we're also involved all across the nuclear fuel cycle, including like, designing and constructing reactors. So uh, Fukushima is, is right, is right in, our, in our, not in our backyard, but it's where we're fully concerned with what's happening at Fukushima. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say is that there is a before and after Fukushima, especially for those of my generation. Uh, we were born in the 1980s. Uh, most of us were too young or not born when Chernobyl happened. Um, and the events at Fukushima for, for us, for everyone in particular, but for us in particular, are a huge wake-up call. Uh, if, if we needed one, that nuclear safety is absolutely non-negotiable. We learn about that, we live that, we breathe it. Um, but having an event really brings it home. 
um, that we can never be vigilant enough about nuclear safety, that we have to continue to push for ever-improving safety standards. Before that, there was a sort of complacency that reigned. I don't think we can, uh, we can afford to have that complacency now. And that we have to constantly revise and seek to improve our emergency preparedness and response. And I distinguish that from nuclear safety. Part of nuclear safety, but a, but a separate uh, thing that we need to, to work on. It's also a huge wake-up call on how far I think the nuclear industry globally uh, still has to go in improving communication with its stakeholders, in particular the average person on the street. So if I start with nuclear safety, um, the situation at Fukushima nuclear power plant, it, it remains serious today. The situation is not stabilised. The main issues now, the, the issues have changed as the weeks have gone by, as the days initially and now as the weeks have gone by. Uh, the main issues are the management of contaminated water, and we have some experts in, in Japan assisting on that. Um, and reducing the buildup of hydrogen within one of the reactors, I think it was almost stabilized. I haven't checked recently, it may now be stabilized. And until that situation is completely stabilized and the safety of the affected reactors is restored, what we say in the industry is having a, a successful cold shutdown, um, we won't have the necessary information in order to conduct a thorough analysis of what exactly happened and why. So that will take time. Um, the Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Yuki Amano, has called for a ministerial level conference on nuclear safety to be held in June to cover an initial assessment of the Fukushima accident, the lessons to be learned, the strengthening of nuclear safety, as well as the response to nuclear accidents and emergencies. Now, many countries that have nuclear power plants in operation have already launched uh, safety-related rela actions. So in France, for example, and I speak about France because Arriva's uh, headquarters are based in France. Uh, so in France, which has uh, 58 nuclear power reactors producing well over 70% of their electricity, the safety authorities have been asked by the Prime Minister to conduct an audit on the entire French nuclear fleet, as well as the new reactor currently under construction. And this audit will test the safety systems in place at each nuclear power plant under specific scenarios that may not have been studied previously due to the extremely low probability of, a, of, of occurrence at a given site. So for example, I'm pretty sure that at certain sites, the combination of a, of a nine on a Richter scale earthquake plus a tsunami has not been included in the design basis of the reactor. Those are things that now the safety authorities are looking at on each nuclear power plant. And that's in terms of both plant design, so the technical design, do we need to retrofit those designs? Do we need to do things with that? Um, and in terms of the actual organization of post-accident management procedure, which is a really crucial uh, part of that as well. Separately, the European Union has requested all its member states to conduct safety checks on the 140-odd reactors uh, that there are in Europe. And just as the relevant ministries and safety <coughs> authorities each have a role to play in assessing and strengthening nuclear safety and reinforcing emergency preparedness, so does the industry have a role to play. The operator of nuclear power plants, obviously first in line, so that in the case of Japan is like TEPCO, uh, Kansai, uh, EPCO, Kyushu, etc., all utilities that run nuclear power plants. In France, it's electricity de France, etc., etc. But the designers and the constructors of nuclear power plants, so that concerns people like us, Arriva, can also take on a role. Um, that role will first be in, in assisting our customers uh, in, in all the, on all these safety checks. Um, and if there are retrofits that need to be, to be applied. But more generally, uh, in actively promoting even safety reactor designs and uh, ever more stringent safety standards. And that's something that we've always pushed for. So if I turn now to communication, uh, dialogue with our stakeholders uh, has never, ever been a strong point of the nuclear industry. If anyone tells, to try to tell you that we have been good at doing that, they're lying. It's not been a good point. Um, yes, nuclear power is one of those subjects that suffer from a huge gap in the perception of its risks by experts and the perception of its risks by non-experts. That's true. It's just simply it's due to its nature. Radioactivity is invisible. We don't see it. We, don't, we have no way of detecting it. Well, we have a way of detecting it, but we don't grow up knowing that there's a way of detecting it. Um, it's invisible. It's unknown. It's associated uh, with catastrophic and memorable incidents. Now today more than ever when you've got 24 news on CNN, for example. If anyone looked at that coverage of the Fukushima accident. Um, the list goes on of why there's this huge gap uh, in the perception of the risk. But on the other hand, the nuclear industry globally has not always been transparent about the risks or made an effort to explain those risks in language that non-experts can understand. 
And on the whole, I would say they've often behaved fairly arrogantly. I speak in the past, but I still see it happening today. Uh, from time to time, they tell people, you know, there are people who tell people in the nuclear industry or who are pro-nuclear that tell people that they're essentially stupid to mistrust nuclear technology um, instead of really dealing genuinely with people's concerns. And that's, it's, it's not going to get us anywhere. We need to deal with that. <coughs> that was an issue that already needed working on prior to Fukushima. Um, and that's now become an issue that I, I think needs very urgent work. The industry as a whole, whether it be as operators of uranium mines, other fuel cycle facilities, or nuclear reactors, I think has a very important and has a very proactive role to take in this. In addition to the communication that's necessary on nuclear power in general, um, there are certainly lessons to be learned regarding communication during an emergency. Um, indeed, the IAEA Director General mentioned in his statement to the Board of Governors just 10 days after the uh, first earthquake struck that one lesson was already clear that the current international emergency response framework needs to be reassessed, that it was designed in the 1980s following Chernobyl and before the information revolution, and that it needs to be updated to reflect the realities of the 21st century. As he put it, live television and the internet provide constant updates on a crisis situation, not always accurately, to a global audience. <coughs> So I'll just finish my opening remarks by making a few comments about the possible implications for Australia. Mm -hmm. We have no nuclear power reactors in operation or planned, and the only nuclear-related facilities that we ha operate in Australia are uranium mines, and of course, if you want to put that as an industrial facility, a research reactor at Lucas Heights. So we might ask what role can or should Australia be playing in this post-Fukushima period? To answer this question, I think it's always useful to have a look at our immediate neighbours in Southeast Asia. We always talk about China, India. Southeast Asia, there's a lot happening in the nuclear domain. Um, it's easy to see why. Population of over half a billion, energy demand increasing at 2 or 3% per year, estimated additional electrical, electricity generation capacity of 250 gigawatts required by 2030, and over 80% of its electricity mix predicted to still come from fossil fuels by that date. Now, at least six countries in Southeast Asia, so Vietnam, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, and Singapore, and I'll come back to Singapore, are se were seriously considering launching nuclear power before Fukushima, and the initial reactions post-Fukushima show that, for the most part, they are still continuing with those plans, albeit with an increased emphasis on safety, which is no bad thing, uh, both from a technical viewpoint and, more importantly, from a human and organizational viewpoint. And I think when we look at our region and we, we see what's happening, we can say, we can rephrase that question of what role we, we can or should play by saying, what are the risks and opportunities uh, for Australia in this context of developing uh, nuclear power regionally? And irrespective of what decision we take, often the debate in Australia focuses on should we have nuclear power or shouldn't we? I think the world is, the world is moving on. We need to think strategically about what role uh, we can play in this context. Um, just a few words about Singapore. Uh, you may have wondered at my inclusion of Singapore in those list of countries uh, looking at nuclear power. Those of you who know a bit about Singapore uh, or have been there, you'd imagine that it's not a particularly suitable place uh, for a large-scale nuclear power plant. But the government's realised that with so many of its neighbours being involved in nuclear power, it needs to put itself in a position in which it can mitigate against the potential risk of nuclear power and also put itself in a position in which it can seize opportunities uh, in the growing uh, industry regionally or worldwide. So it's actually undertaking a wide-ranging feasibility study to look at uh, the introduction of nuclear power from 2030 onwards, um, simply in order to be better informed prior to taking any decisions for its own energy policy. And in parallel, it's launching collaborations with research institutes in nuclear uh, countries, uh, getting very involved at the regulatory and policy level in nuclear issues, and developing undergraduate programs in various nuclear disciplines. And it has reiterated, reiterated post-Fukushima that the work it's undertaking is now even more important than before. And for me personally, from Australia, when I see the long-term strategic view that a country like Singapore is capable of taking, it is extraordinarily frustrating that in Australia we are just not capable of doing the same. Thank you very much, uh, Selena. Now, we were going to have uh, a, a bit of a discussion within the panel before we move to... Uh, questions from the floor, but, uh, but in view of the time, um, uh, what, I, what I'd propose is to ask my panellists uh, if there are any brief, brief additional points they would like to make in view of the, of the, uh, of the presentations, uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll move to questions from the floor. So, can, can I just take up, yes, I just take up one point and mm. uh, can I just reflect on two, two things which Selena said uh, and 
put them together. Um, and one is that um, uh, one is that Fukushima has been a wake-up call on safety, uh, and uh, it's, it's not surprising that countries have reacted by looking at the safety of their nuclear power plants. Um, Selena also said, and I agree with this as well, that the nuclear industry hasn't been very good communicating mm. um, about, uh, about itself. And I think there's an opportunity here um, to, talk about, to talk about the safety uh, of the industry uh, and the initiatives which are being taken to uh, address concerns which arise out of Fukushima uh, in a way which is uh, less technical, more engaging, uh, and uh, based, upon a, based upon much better assumptions about the way in which um, uh, the ordinary person in the street looks at the nuclear industry um, because they don't look at it uh, uh, in an ignorant way and they don't look at it in an irrational or ideological way. They look at it from the perspective of their worldview. And for them, that's completely rational and completely non-ideological. And I think, uh, as I say, I think there's an opportunity here for the, the nuclear industry and the uranium industry to address those kind of the, the, the safety concerns which people will have as a result of Fukushima uh, in a different way and a better way than perhaps we've addressed those in the past. John, do you want to add anything? Yeah, my, my only comment here is that <clears throat> by addressing to saying we have a wake-up call on safety, it's like saying that when that A380 Airbus blew an engine and a near miss and came back and it was a wake-up call for the safety of the airline industry. That's not true. The airline industry has safety as a high regard and it is at every event causes a revisit on that safety to see how we can improve that. It's interesting how a complex piece of technology like an airliner today, the, the safety and the integrity of those aircraft, <coughs> uh, in one case there are two airline, there are two basic Boeing and Airbus. They are uh, one by a private enterprise, one by a, 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 a sort of a smorgasbord of government agencies. Um, and yet both, both parties build extraordinary safe aircraft. The picking up too much on how, how bad the people are, which I recognise has to be communication, but it's not really got only to our industry. When Rolls-Royce were approached about that Trent 9000, they have not still yet spoken about that engine. So this is not a nuclear business or a, you know, to say we're just isolating. You've got to put a context in it. I think it's a, 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 a revisit to a highly safe industry and where can we improve it? Where do we have to improve it? And the communication issues are across the board in corporate industrial world. Mm. Mm. That's it. Selena, do you have anything you'd like to, to add? <clears throat> up on something I said. I'll just qualify my remarks. Um, when I said a wake-up call, I think, and I was referring in particular to our generation, I wasn't saying that it, it indicates that the nuclear industry doesn't have safety at the forefront of its mind at all. Not at all what I intended. So if you understood that, uh, let me qualify that. Wasn't the intention. Um, it's just that when you have an event like that, you have to remember the industry is not the industry. It, is con it consists of humans. Mm. It consists of humans who work in that industry. Um, and, and amongst us, particularly, and I highlighted our generation because we haven't lived through Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, etc. Fukushima for us is the first real life event where we see how it's played out in the media, in the world. And uh, for those of us who, who weren't aware of that or who had that sort of theoretically in our mind that safety was important and we applied it every day, um, Fukushima re reinforces that for us. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, John. Richard Bronowski, uh, Sydney University. Uh, firstly, uh, can I quickly say that I think you've given a bum rap to the press. The journalists who've been in, in Japan have worked very hard, very assiduously to, to report the situation. They're not media jackals. I'd say to you that they're, they're reporting very effectively and very carefully on what is going on. Secondly, can any of the panel uh, may sustain your optimism, please, and this is my question, when we looked at the fact that in 2002 there were 444 reactors operating around the world 
Today in 2011, 437 reactors. The number is going down. There are 64 reactors under construction, but 12 of those have been un under construction for the last 20 years. Meanwhile, there are regulatory provisions that the IAEA is bringing in, including one to try to stop uh, an accident like 9-11 uh, happening and having some sort of a basin under the reactor to stop uh, highly irradiated fuel from getting out. So where, where, what is the basis, the groundwork for your optimism, or is it simply that you want to sell uranium and therefore you're committed commercially to this industry? So who would like to uh, answer that? I'll have a go. Okay. <laughs> John. This is the, the polar, the, the two spectrums here. And I'm, I'm hoping I'll tell you a bit of the reality. This is a real rejuvenation of nuclear. This is a, a, a situation where we are a company that has developed the first two new uranium mines. We have product and we are being approached by all of the emerging nuclear groups to buy this material with real money and with, with real construction programs up ahead. There will be seven to ten nuclear plants coming online from 2015 beyond. This is how, and it'll go up to 10 to 15. And that's the intensity and the measure of the amount of effort in the construction side of the business. And uh, Selena, I don't know if you have any. Yeah, uh, it's just so from the point of view of Areva, so as I mentioned, we're involved in the, in the nuclear fuel cycle and, and in construction. Um, prior to Fukushima, obviously, we, we've been hiring huge amounts per year, so we see the whole nuclear industry growing just on the ground. Um, and post-Fukushima, the initial reactions we have in our consultations with our customers, our prospective customers, is that in a lot of the countries, in particular in Asia, and I think uh, if the Lowe Institute titled this Asia's Nuclear Future, it's because a lot of that growth is in Asia, countries like China, India, etc., who, who have that need, the drivers that Michael and John mentioned, the fundamental needs for having nuclear, not as the solution, but in the energy mix, uh, continue to be true. And so they're going to go and look at things. They're going to be uh, more rigorous about the regulatory requirements, perhaps on the reactors, on the siting of the reactors, on the safety infrastructure and the organization uh, about it. But it will continue. So it's, it's, a, it's a prudent optimism, I would say. I've heard that question about the number of reactors before, and uh, what I did was look at, uh, over the last 50 years, the number of reactors in one year compared to the number of reactors in the previous year, and I would say regularly the number of actors in a later year is frequently fewer than the number of reactors in a previous year, but all the time over the last 50 years, uh, the capacity of the nuclear industry has increased. So I think the number of reactors is, uh, is frankly, is a bit of a is a bit of a red herring. Uh, on the press, uh, look, John, John, you can defend your remark about the press, but uh, I think what I, what I said was that I recognise the, uh, recognise the pressures that frontline journalists are under. And uh, yes, I think that, uh, I, I think that uh, frequently, uh, frequently uh, yeah, um, they did get things wrong, but I don't blame them for that because I think, I think, the, uh, I think the, issue, the issues facing frontline journalists in the, in the chaos of a, an earthquake and a tsunami and a nuclear emergency are, uh, are pretty difficult for us here in Sydney or Melbourne to appreciate. Um, having said that, what I would say is that seems to me to be another opportunity for us to think about in our industry to how, how we actually engage with journalists, particularly recognising that uh, the people reporting from the front line have been thrown into this um, at the, at, uh, you know, uh, to report it you know, with no notice at all. So I think that's, uh, that's something we need to think about. And perhaps newspapers need to think about it too. So, let me get, please, the uh, lady up to the back there. Karen Snowden from Radio Australia ABC. Thanks for the opportunity for a question. To Selena, if I may, um, the critics in India about the Jaitapur um, nuclear reactors that Ariva is about to build um, say that not enough consideration has gone into their location. They're too close to where the Gujarat um, earthquake happened in 2001, where I think 20,000 people died. Can you um, elaborate a little bit on whether Areva is reviewing the design or 
anything about uh, those nuclear reaction, reactors that you're building there? Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll give this a shot, but I'll just preface my comments with saying that I, I know that, I mean, I'm aware of the dossier, but I'm not uh, intimately involved in the dossier, so I can't comment on the, on the details of that. And it's also a dossier that's continuing under negotiation as well. Um, I'll just, I'll distinguish, I'll just, I think I'll talk around the subject in terms of distinguishing the reactor design from the siting of the reactor. Okay, the reactor design tends to be standard, so the reactor we're building there is what's some of you may have heard of a generation three reactor. Um, it has the uh, thing I think that Richard Bernowski mentioned, which is a core catcher that's built into our, uh, our reactor design, which is in the case of a fuel meltdown, uh, of a core meltdown, that it will be all be contained. It uh, meets the requirements post 9-11, it has the double containment. So in terms of uh, improving safety standards, that's, that's our latest model, okay? So that's the reactor design itself. Um, in terms of the siting, I'm not aware of the particulars. Um, Nearly having, a, having an earthquake uh, is, is not, it, it's something to be taken into account in the siting. What is really the red line, that, or the red flag that we mustn't cross is obviously if you're near a fault line. I mean, that's, that's really, you need to have stable ground uh, when you site your reactor. I'm not aware of the tsunami uh, effects. I, I can't remember exactly where Jaitapu is and, and if that's, if that's a, a thing to be built in. So I think in, in that sense, we would have to, and we're involved in that, we need to look at carefully where the siting is, bring our expertise, and talk about how our reactor in particular, on that particular site, it's really a case-by-case -case basis, um, meets, does it demonstrate the safety requirements? And that's, that's really what it is. We can't say this reactor is safe everywhere, or this site is safe. It's really a case-by-case -case basis. There will be requirements. This reactor at this place, with these characteristics, does it meet the safety requirements of the safety regulatory authority in that country? Rishi Gulati, University of New South Wales. And my question is, why is there such resistance to accepting that Fukushima was a wake-up call? And it was extremely disappointing why Selena uh, qualified her comment in the end, because it was quite correct. And using the speaker's analogy, the ramifications that flow from um, an aeroplane engine failure uh, are bad, but the ramifications of a nuclear uh, malfunction in a, uh, in a plant are very catastrophic, and the extent to which Fukushima uh, could cause damage um, cannot be assessed at this early stage, and I um, uh, just uh, would appreciate a response on that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that where I'm saying that there is success, the Japanese have come out with a roadmap, which I think has been uh, determined after much consideration. In their mind, there is a a six to nine month solution, at which stage they, they believe that they will uh, uh, stabilise these reactors. So in, in that context, I, I think that uh, certainly it, uh, there was uh, non-preparedness in the, in the reaction, but without electricity, without uh, those support, and uh, it took some time. Uh, yeah, I, I qualify my remarks because I didn't want it to be misinterpreted as saying that I believe the nuclear industry is not safe. This is not yeah. the case. So, um, I think that, again, we need to put into context, look at the number of, uh, I forget how many we are now, 14,000 reactor years or something like this, uh, around the world where nuclear power has been uh, producing this electricity. It's not without risk, okay? No power source is without risk. Um, and it's, it's always a case of, of, of looking at those benefits and risks in a particular country or in a particular situation and saying, are we as a society prepared to put up with those risks for the benefits that we get from it? Mm. So I don't take away my qualification and I don't take away the fact that it was a wake-up call. Can, can I just comment on the second half of your question, which is about um, uh, <clears throat> the, size of, the size of the problem following Fukushima? Um, and I have to say that... Um, and I, and I say this genuinely, in, in our industry, we've tried to kind of keep in the moment here. We've tried to say and to, tell, to, talk, to talk to people and tell people what's been happening right now. Um, and we've, we've, we've tried to avoid um, uh, uh, forecasting, predicting, uh, or estimating what might happen as a result of Fukushima. Uh, firstly, because I think that's not a safe thing to do. Um, um, uh, and, uh, and secondly, because what we know, uh, what we know from the studies done of Chernobyl uh, is that one of the major health risks, one of the health effects of Chernobyl was, on, uh, was a psychological health risk caused by a fear of radiation. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and uh, so I, I think at this stage, when um, we don't have a clear idea, uh, well, let me put it this way, I think it's too hard to predict what the, uh, the consequences of uh, uh, Fukushima might be, or who, whoever wants to predict that is taking a risk. I think we should be careful to remember that uh, talking up fears of radiation are potentially uh, damaging for the people who have been evacuated from the area and the people who live there. Uh, Sandy Longworth from the, the Warren Centre. I think my question's probably directed to uh, Selena Ning. Uh, Selena, the, the world is seeing uh, a, uh, an, an enormous expansion in small uh, modular nuclear reactors. Uh, it, it, probably in the next five years, we're going to see uh, a, an abundance of these predominantly going into developing countries, I believe. And these are, for the audience benefit, these are reactors that are probably 10 megawatts and they could be visualised as a nuclear battery. They'll have a 30-year life, they'll be factory manufactured, they'll be delivered. Uh, these are eminently suited for uh, certain situations in Australia. But my question is, these are certainly going to find widespread application around the world. It is going to change the world's perception of nuclear power. Uh, and uh, I think, well, would you like to comment on that? Thank you. In the next five years, we're not convinced. Uh, we're working on a, on a small model, which is more at the 100 megawatt uh, level. Um, there's a lot of, uh, of reporting in the media about small modular reactors. I think a lot of it is very idealistic. It will take time for that to become industrially commercial and viable, et cetera. So um, will it change perception? It may contribute, as, as, uh, but I think there will be other factors as well. So I'm, I'm a little bit uh, less optimistic about the timeline. Tony Owen, um, spent fuel in reactor cooling ponds has been an issue in this event. Do operators and designers now have to reassess uh, the amount of fuel that's kept close to the reactor? and um, perhaps different ways of, of storing spent fuel? Absolutely right. I mean, for those, I'm not sure how much that came out in the, in the general media. One of the big issues uh, at Fukushima is the spent fuel. The, we like to call it used fuel because we recycle it, so we don't call it spent. Uh, used fuel in the cooling ponds and uh, losing those ponds, losing the ability, uh, well, losing water, losing the coolant. Um, and so the risk there was that the used fuel got very hot, um, and then there's a risk of oxida oxidation and, and all sorts of other radiological risks. Um, that's one of the issues that's being looked at. Yes, uh, it's one of the issues that's being looked at. Um, what can I say more than that? Um, spent fuel needs to be cooled in any case. The question is, uh, do we need to have extra coolant? Do we need to now look at the case um, of if, for whatever reason, we lose power supply and uh, we lose the coolant and we cannot replace it. You know, what's the longest period that we need to have coolant there for? These, this is one of the, the key priorities um, that's being addressed by a lot of regulators, particularly for the existing uh, power plants. I mean, Lincoln, a number of speakers have referred to the growing energy needs of countries, particularly Asian region countries. But what's the reason for meeting those energy needs? the overall mix of those energy needs with nuclear generation, either of any particular proportion or of any proportion at all? Uh, look, I think uh, countries in Asia themselves choose their own energy needs. Uh, and it's not, I think, for us to, to tell them whether they should use uh, nuclear or coal or renewables. In fact, they use all of those. Mm. Uh, and all of, the, all of those will grow. Uh, and, uh, um, and I would, you know, I think my view would be that so they should. And, uh, and so when, when you hear, uh, we here on the stage being advocates uh, on the nuclear side of this, I don't think you should assume that we're saying, well, it's only nuclear and nothing else. Yeah. Uh, I think energy security tells us that uh, uh, the world needs all, the, all those energy sources. They all, they all have a role. Their roles are different. They're not substitutes for each other. Um, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't rule any of them out. Uh, the only other thing is, is that each of those fuels have a different physicality. The, the fossil fuels are bulks. Uh, which you can only have um, stored inventories uh, which are one month ahead. And uh, with though, if you have uh, a nuclear, you can have strategic inventories in your country and those reactors, are, your electricity 
uh, sort of blend is balanced with security. And security is a huge issue in uh, electricity generation. It can, it can cause governments to, to, to fail. Social unrest. They are now, it's so integrated into society that electricity is a, is a, is a, is a risk and that risk is mitigated by fuel mix. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Martin Thomas is my name. Uh, a very quick yes-no answer from each one of the panel. Does the panel feel that a public uh, debate triggered by a repeat of the 2006 Uranium Task Force, the Ziggy Switkowski Task Force, would be an appropriate thing in our community given the very wide uh, interest in um, getting to the facts of the matter and the underlying science? I think we should have a debate. These, I, I believe that the unbelievable complexity of climate change and the complexity of nuclear have similar, uh, people have to grapple with, with these and without big debates, everybody will be marginalised. And I don't think we'll have a climate change uh, agreeing until everybody understands the enormity of what everybody's talking about.